verse 32 of chapter 4 of Acts. Now the multitude, notice, remember, there's a multitude. There's 5,000 of them at least we know now. Now the multitude of those who believed, believe is the word pistio. It's the Greek word that means they entrusted their spiritual well-being into Christ. By faith, they believed that Christ was the Messiah. Were of one heart, their hearts were together, they were in union, one soul, because they're all now believing in Christ, they put on the mind of Christ, became baptized into the body of Christ. Neither did anyone say, look at this, look, this is a very important line that most people never look at. Neither did anyone, not one person among that number say that any of the things he possessed was his own. But they had all things in common. Listen to me. Did you hear what I just said? Not one person in that number of 5,000 said, don't touch it, it's mine. Do you remember that? That's the self-life. That's what I want you to see in this. That's the little bitty child that you don't need to train it. He's born with a sin nature and you touch something and he says, mine, mine, mine. That's a selfish nature where you think that it's yours. Listen to me. That's the nature that needs to die. We're seeing the witness of what happens when someone comes and is dependent upon God, filled with His Spirit, and they're doing His work for His glory. Now, nothing that they have belongs to them. It all belongs to the Lord. We should hang on to everything. Everything that the Lord gives us, just like this. Open hands so that He can use it for His glory. Everything that you have is to be used for souls to be saved. It's to be used so people will see something different because you know Jesus Christ. Possessed. Nothing that they possessed. The word possessed there means the things in their hand, their property, their possessions, their goods, their substance. None of it. They treated it as this is yours, Lord. What do you want me to do with it? Because now you belong to God and everything you have belongs to God. It's his possession. And now you are required as a steward to be found faithful with it. To be faithful to use it as an ambassador for his kingdom. Not for your kingdom. None of it. Look at it. The self-life is dead. They said this is all God's stuff. What do we do with it? How do we do it? And they had all things in common. It means they shared all the things they had. It's from a word that means union. It's not, it means companionship. Now, it's not the word koinonia, which a lot of you might be thinking about. That's the word for fellowships, and it means all things in common and a partnership. It's not that word, but it's similar to it. But it just means that they, that they had all things uh, shared by several people or all the people. I want to give you an understanding of that. You still have to be wise as a steward. Listen, you don't give your stuff away to somebody that's not honoring God. Think about it. If you've got God's property, if I give you my property and say, hold this till I come back, and somebody comes up in need of it, and, and, and they're crooked, and they're not doing what they should be doing, and you know that they're not, you don't just give them my property. And you definitely don't give up God's property unless you tell them about the Word of God. And that's one of the biggest things that most of the institutional, cultural churches are doing today. They want to hand out all of God's resources. They want, they want the church to give it to them out of their pocket. Then they hand out their resources, but they're never speaking the word of God boldly to the people. They just want to take care of needs so they can pat themselves on the back and say, we did this, we did that. We have a ministry that does this much benevolence, but it's not obeying the word of God. The church tithe, gifts, and offerings should always take care of God's house first. And God's house has God's children in it. And God's children should not be doing without. But all things in common means that we're all doing the work of the ministry together. So some people have issues and things that go on, but it's because they're being disobedient to their calling. And so then it's up to the body of Christ to judge what's going on and what they're supposed to do about that. That's why when we help people, we might help them once. If we help them a second time, we counsel them about their life before we help them. 
We counsel them about the things that's wrong in their life and that we think God would want them to get right in their life and work on before we keep giving God's resources to them. If they don't want to come underneath and surrender to God, then I'm not going to give them God's money. Because they're still in rebellion, and their rebellion could be exactly what it takes for God to get them to the end of himself and chastise them and break them and bring them to a full knowledge of who he is. So if I give them money and money and money and put a pillow under their head, they're probably never going to come to the full knowledge because everything's going to be okay. And they just run to the, to the bank to get more money from the church instead of hearing the word of God being preached with boldness or spoken to them with boldness. And they never come to a saving knowledge because their conscience is never pricked. Their conscience is never hearing truth. That's what the church is supposed to be doing. All things in common. What happens when there's one heart and one soul and we're all living for Christ and we're all taking what we have and wanting to use it for God's glory in the common good of getting the gospel out? It says in 33, and with great power... The apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, and great grace was upon them all. See, when we all come together in unity, there's going to be power and great grace. Great power and great grace. Do you see that? Great power. Not just power, not just grace, but great power and great grace. And when it happens, we're going to see over in chapter 5 as this continues, then great fear comes upon those around them because they see a real living picture of who Christ is and who his people are. So it's great power, great grace, which creates great fear because we serve a great God who is a great shepherd to his people and he loves us. Power is the word deutimus. It's miraculous power, miraculous strength. It's miraculous uh, uh, boldness. It, it, it shows us that the power didn't come from us because I don't have any miraculous strength. I don't have any miraculous power. I don't have any miraculous boldness. It needs to come from the filling of the Holy Spirit because we're looking to do the work of the ministry for the glory of God. We're pointing to Jesus, his servant Jesus. So they gave witness. That's the Greek word martis. That's what he said would happen in Acts 1.8. The Holy Spirit will come upon you and you will be witnesses. It comes, it's martaos, but it's the word that comes from the Greek word martyr, which means one who dies for their faith. The evidence was there. The testimony was there. The proof was there that they were living for Jesus because of the great power and the great preaching and the boldness that they had. But they preached the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. Notice that was central to every gospel message should be central to the resurrection of Jesus. Why? Because that's the evidence, that's the proof that Jesus Christ was the Messiah of God. That's the proof that God accepted his blood atoning sacrifice for you and me. That's the proof that we're putting our faith, we're believing in God's Messiah, God's uh, provision for the sin nature, God's provision for payment for the sins of the world. So you have to preach resurrection so that they know they're believing in the true Messiah. We're justified through his resurrection. Just as if we never sinned. It needs to be central. Resurrection means to stand up again. It means he stood up from the grave. It is also means a recovery of spiritual truth. What we need today in our Christian lives, in our Christian churches, and those who call upon the name of Jesus Christ is a recovery of spiritual truth. We need to lay aside tradition. We need to lay aside denominations. We need to lay aside all of these things that we're doing in culturality and have a recovery of the Word of God because of the Spirit of God that we need to be boldness in God for the glory of God. We need a resurrection of a type of spiritual truth. It needs to be raised from the dead. The spiritual truth, the attack is on the word of God. And we're burying the word of God. And we're playing politically correctness. We're playing social gospel. We're playing all of these games. And it becomes a man-made institution. Amen. We 
We need to bring the word of God out of the grave and stand it back up again. And with boldness, let people know that there's no other name on heaven and earth by which men can be saved except that of Jesus Christ. Can I get a witness? Amen. And then he says in 34, nor was there anyone among them who lacked. In other words, they didn't, they, none of them was without. The word means deficit. None of them were without. They all had exactly what they needed. The church was taking care of them. See, God said, I will provide for all your needs according to my riches and glory by Christ Jesus. But that doesn't happen when we live our own separate lives. When we do our own thing. Look what Paul said to the church in Philippi in chapter 2. Now I like to always bring this up. It's a very important scripture. Chapter 2, Philippians, verse 1. Therefore, if there is any consolation in Christ, any encouragement. We're getting ready to see Barnabas, the son of consolation. If any comfort of love, if any fellowship, koinonia, of the spirit. Because we all have the same spirit. Any affection, any love and mercy Fulfill my joy by being like-minded. This is what the early church was. That's what he's trying to pass on to all the other church little bodies in different towns, different regions. He's wanting them to be like the first church. And it wasn't because he was there. He didn't get saved till years later. It's because the Spirit of God was telling him to say the same thing to the other churches. To have the same mind, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing, listen to this, let nothing be done with my, 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 me, 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 me. Let nothing be done with selfish ambition, self-like flesh is dead, or conceit, like, oh, I deserve this. But in lowliness, humility of mind. Let each esteem others better than himself. In other words, if each one of us lift everybody else up to, above us, then the ground would be level and to cross the way it is, really. If I would esteem you higher than me, and you would esteem me higher than you, and we do that all around the room, and all of us esteeming others better, looking to serve them and lay our life down for them the way that Christ did, then the ground becomes level at the cross. Esteem others better than himself. Verse 4. Let each of you. This is what the body of Christ is supposed to do. Not just the church in Philippi. Let each of you look out. Not only for his own interest. But also for the interest of others. This is the mind of Christ. His own interest. He was free. He was perfect. Holy. Seated in heaven. And he stood up and took off. And laid down part of his deity. He voluntarily came down to become a servant and died on a cross to look out for your interest and my interest and to redeem us and bring us back into fellowship with the Father. And he calls us to do the same thing. Every decision you make, everything you do in the body of Christ affects the rest of the body of Christ. If my arm is broken, it affects my whole body. Now I've got to try to use my other hand. If my leg is broken, it affects all of my body. Everything that you do affects the rest of the body of Christ. It's so important that we understand that we need to ask the Holy Spirit to help us be concerned with others, to help us understand the one another ministry, to help us look out for other people's interests and not just our own. And that's why we have all things in common. That's why I believe we have the tithe, the gifts, the offerings. That's why I believe it is, it is, it is very important how I spend the church's money. And that's why I'm always calling people and talking to people. We prayed for over three years about buying a little barn. Over three years. My flesh wanted to rush right out and buy it. And God made a way for us to buy it. Listen, we don't have to do anything quickly, but we need to be a good steward with God's money. I prayed for over three years over a truck. I mean, you have to rush right out. The world wants you to rush right out and get it. Just do it. You can do it. What does God want us to do? What's the interest of others? How are we going to show evidence of faith if we do everything like everybody else does? 
We need to come together in prayer. That's why I always say, this is the equipping of the saints. We're learning great stuff. But the prayer meeting is the most important meeting. Wednesday night when we pray, Jesus said, my house should be a house of prayer. It's a place of dependency. It's a place of coming and learning and hearing the voice of God. It's a place of understanding where our power comes from and who we represent, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Getting a little excited here. Again, verse 34, Acts 4. Now, nor was there anyone among them who lacked, for all who were possessors of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of the things that were sold and laid them at the apostles' feet, and they distributed to each one as anyone had need. So the apostles, with everything was given to them, and they handed it out. Now listen to me, because this is very, this is very tedious here. That's why I was talking about the tithe and how whatever is here. I mean, anybody that goes to this church can look at our books, but you got to have good reason to look at our books. I don't want people looking at our books just to be starting problems and arguing about things. But listen, when they did this, it wasn't necessarily a great thing. Listen to me. Because when you give everything away, they became poor in the church in Jerusalem. And you see Paul later taking up a donation from all the other churches to send help back to them. But don't miss the point that because they had need, the rest of the churches supplied it. Because that's the body of Christ at large, supplying for other people. That's why we do missions. That's why we send people to the uttermost parts of the earth. So it's not always good to sell all of your possessions and shove them in one place and then stand there and wait for Jesus to come back. In your heart, live like he's coming back today, but plan like he won't be back in your lifetime. But it does, it does not mean not to give. It does not mean to, to grip your stuff. I mean, I know people that's got two or three stoves and two or three whatever, and they build barns and they store all their goods in it. And Jesus says, you fool, your soul will be required of you tonight. We need to trust the Lord. That's faith. We need to give to the church because that's what God has called us to do so we can take care of the needs of the ministry. But we also need to plan like he's not coming back. It's good to give an inheritance to your children. It's good to give an inheritance to your children and leave them supplies to make their life better so they can do the work of the ministry. But why give them all the money if you don't give them Jesus? Secondly, this has been attacked and misinterpreted as socialism. Socialism. It's not socialism. See, socialism is a government ruling system that comes and takes your money and gives it to who they want. These people voluntarily had all things in common because of the love of Christ that compelled them to do it. Nobody forces you to give anything to anybody. But God calls you because of his love and because you become children of life that you would want to walk in that same love and look out for the interest of other people that don't have what you have. That you would spend your money properly and that you would take care of one another. It's not a forced thing where they say, I'm going to take all your money and everybody's going to have the same thing. Communal living isn't the same as communism and socialism. They rule with an iron thumb. They don't give you the freedom to follow Jesus. Socialism destroys. Go look at Venezuela. Go look at some of the countries that's tried democratic socialism and see the death of those countries. They have lines where people stand and can't even get food where they were once prosperous countries. Socialism is bad, it's from the devil. Communal living where you're concerned with other people and you love them because Christ first loved you and he's given you a stewardship to use your possessions to take care of people and to speak the word of God with boldness. That's the gospel. But when somebody makes you do it, it's socialism.
takes lots of prayer to hand out stuff. The church's possessions. As I said earlier, we don't just give them away easily when we give them away. 36. And Joseph, some of these translations say Joseph, which means he will add, who was also named Barnabas. So they give him the nickname Barnabas by the apostles, uh, which is translated son of encouragement. King James says son of consolation. It's the son of consolation. It means comfort and entreaty. So he's always encouraging others by how he lives. And that's what we should be doing as Christians. Son of encouragement. He's a Levite. Tribe of Levi. So he's supposed to be a priest of the country of Cyprus. Having land, sold it and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. So now we're going to break down into a, a specific instance. And this we'll pick this up next week. We're probably going to end here. But you want to see first this. Because Barnabas is very important. Son of consolation, son of encouragement. You speed forward and you get to Paul. The first missionary journey, where does it go? Paul and Barnabas leave Antioch. Two miles away is Cyprus. And they go to Barnabas' hometown to do the first missionary journey. That's the first place they go on the journey. Right? Because they were familiar with it. And there was a large population of Jewish people there. And they wanted to share the gospel first with the Jew and then to the Greek. But we want to understand this because now he's going to hone in on how to give away your property, how to share your property, how to walk in love, how to be an encourager, how to do this. Second thing is this. If you look back, if you look back in Numbers 18, 22, and 24, Deuteronomy 10, 9, you find out that the Levites weren't supposed to have property. And I'm going to close with this thought. He was a Levitical priest. His inheritance was God. And when people give to the church, then his, his food and everything was provided by them giving to the temple. But a Levite was not supposed to have land. And he's got land. Maybe because he's in Cyprus. Maybe because they've walked away from the true God of the Bible at that time. And they weren't doing what they should have been doing. But Barnabas was a Levite who was not supposed to have land. And he was correcting his life. Listen to me. He, this is the testimony of what's going on when he come to Christ. And he says, wait a minute. Even under the old system as a Levite, I wasn't supposed to own this land. I want to get right with God. I want to repent. I want to change my mind. And he was all in. He sold his stuff. He brought it and laid it at the apostles' feet. And he said, I don't need anything here. I want Jesus. See, because everything you have down here, now you've got to take care of it. And you have to put it before you put Jesus. Or you're subject to put it before you put Jesus. Because now I've got to wash my car. Now I've got to fix my house. Now all these things... But when you, when you understand that you're not supposed to be entangled with the affairs of this life, and you hold on to all your possessions like this, and you put Jesus first, you can be free to do whatever he wants you to do. Now, I always talk about them tent pegs and numbers because I remember my first sermon ever in the church. And it was about tent pegs. It was about tent pegs. And I was told not to put my tent pegs in too deep. See, because you're earthly, we're earthbound, you're not going to be doing what God wants you to do. If your tent pegs are in so deep that you can't pull up your roots and say, we're going over here to camp out now. Because, see, we're just pilgrims here. We're passerbyers. This is not our home. We're living in earthly tents with our soul. And we also, this stuff down here doesn't belong to us. It's earthly tents. But if you drive your tent pegs in so deep that you can't hear the voice of God and do the work of God, then you've been deceived by the devil and you're entangled in the affairs of this life. You want to be able to pull them tent pegs up and go to the uttermost parts of the earth if God was to call you. Not because of who you are, but because of who he is. Because he's filled you with his spirit. Because you're speaking the word of God with boldness. Because you're living the gospel and having all things in common. So there's a contrast coming here. I actually believe that these two verses should be inside chapter 5 because we're going to move into that next week, God willing, and see a contrast of how Ananias and Sapphira 
wanted the notoriety of Barnabas. They wanted the heart of Barnabas. They wanted to look like they were surrendering, but they were lying to God. And they fell dead. It's a powerful story. Don't miss it. But I want you to know that if you come to Jesus and you believe in Jesus, there's the feeling of the Holy Spirit and power and strength and might available, but it's to do His will. It's to walk in love and to fulfill His ministry of the reconciliation of souls. It's to be evidence and a witness and a testimony of what God is doing to redeem lost souls. And you are a steward for Him. And you are required to be found faithful in that work for His glory. Father, we give you praise and glory and we thank you for being a mighty God. We thank you for your word. And we ask, Lord, that you would search us and know us, try us and know our anxious thoughts. See if there be any wicked way in us and lead us in your way everlasting by your spirit, according to your word. Let us be light. Let us learn to shine in 2019. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. The Lord bless you.